You're listening to The Frequency of Creativity with Melinda Har Curley. Welcome everyone to The Frequency of Creativity, where we are at the intersection of energy and art. I'm your host, Melinda Har Curley, and to see how art can bring light and life force energy into your life, Sign up for my newsletter at melindaharcurley.com. Today, I am really excited that we're going to speak with the multi-talented and ingenious artist, Gina Herrera. Welcome, Gina. Well, thank you very much, Melinda, for having me on this podcast. I'm very honored and I'm very lucky to be here today. Well, we're honored and lucky to have you on the podcast. And the reason I'm having you on is because I really believe in what you're doing. Our title for our talk today is On the Front Lines of Sustainable Art. And listeners, as you, we go through the conversation, you'll fully comprehend why Gina and I came up with this title. So Gina creates these lyrical, graceful sculptures out of found objects. Um, Gina has her BFA from the Art Institute of Chicago. She has her MFA from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Gina was also a reservist in the military and spent one year in Iraq and we'll find out later on the conversation that this experience this experience in Iraq is what inspired Gina to create these sculptures. Uh, she had a provost fellowship at, in her MFA. She had a full scholarship. She was nominated for the Joan Mitchell Award. She had a full fellowship at Harpo Foundation Native American to attend the Vermont Studio Center. Gina has exhibited extensively throughout California and the United States. She's received many awards and much recognition. She's also the recipient of grants from the Harold and Ruth Shevin Foundation and the Puffin Foundation. Gina is currently an adjunct professor at Bakersfield College and an art teacher at Arvin High School. Congratulations on all of your accomplishments, Gina. Thank you very much. Gina, I want to start with what gave you the idea, what inspired you to use found objects to, and whenever I'm fortunate enough and go to um, my YouTube channel if you'd like to personally see Gina's sculptures and you would never imagine that she creates these from found objects. Gina, share with us your inspiration and how you got this idea. Well, ever since I was a little girl, I've always been intrigued by nature. I've always felt like nature was my home. Um, I always love trees, animals, and I've always had a strong inclination of, for Mother Earth. And when I was in Iraq for a year, there was this place called a graveyard. And it was this huge plot of land. I mean, thousands and thousands of acres of U.S. trash that we left behind after the war. And there was hump bees, there were propane tanks, there were empty shell casings. There was all kinds of stuff. Even though it was ugly to see it, there was still a beauty of it. You know, how the the metal would deteriorate and rust and the colors and the way the sun hit it. It was very interesting to me, but I also was very saddened by wearing the, the US uniform and being in this rubbish and that we're leaving it behind. So when I went right after my tour, I I applied during that time, I applied for grad school and I got into the university arts as a paint major, painting Mm -hmm. major. And 
I went there and, you know, it was very hard because I was transitioning from living in a, in a war zone to living into a city again. And so I was there and I, you know, took my oil paints and everything like that. But then one day I was in my studio and I was thinking to myself, like, what am I doing using toxic materials to create my voice of being an environmentalist? So I kind of thought long and hard about what I was doing. And I remember in the streets of Philadelphia, they really don't have any alleys. So people threw out their trash once a week and I saw some styrofoam. And I know styrofoam takes many, 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 many years to deteriorate and it's very toxic. So I start picking up these, you know, styrofoam containers and I start carving them. And then I start making these small installations and now down below from the, where my studio was, was a Starbucks. So I would go over there and I would buy my tea and I would ask them, I say, Hey, do you have any coffee grounds? And they say, Oh yeah, we have coffee. Grounds. Cause a lot of people use coffee ground as fertilizer for their gardens. Mm -hmm. So I dried out the coffee and then I used that to cover up um, my, my, my little figurines that I was making out of styrofoam. And so they were maybe about, I don't know, maybe 12 inches. And then, you know, sometimes they grew mold and I don't know, I was so intrigued. Mold is really beautiful when, you know, it's like all this beautiful, like turquoisey green and things like that. And then I start deciding, well, how else can I really start showing what I'm using to the audience? So that's hey, Gina, I I'm going to stop you right okay. there because that's a really good point. And I apologize. We're going to have to take a short break. And then when we come back, you can finish like what the next step was with these creations. But before we take a break, can you please share with our listeners where they can see your work and find out more about you? Well, on my Instagram, my, my handle is Gina with a G, G-I-N-A dot Herrera, H-E-R-R-E-R-A and the number one. Or you can go to my website, www.GinaHerrera.com. Audience, please stay with us and we'll find out what the next step was with Gina to create these beautiful found object sculptures. <laughs> we're back with the frequency of creativity where we are at the intersection of energy and art and Jean, i'm so sorry i had to interrupt you but you were just saying that your studio was above a starbucks that you collected the styrofoam figures, you started small sculptures of 12 inches, then you started to cover them at coffee grounds from Starbucks, and then you were admiring the beauty of mold that formed on them. Yes, I don't know, I, because it's a natural phenomenon, and I was really intrigued by that, but some of my classmates were very annoyed by it, so, but it's okay, <laughs> you know, sometimes I always push it to the end. So I, I kind of was very fascinated by these forms of like these little tiny figurines, they almost look like, like spiritual beings. And then I'm like thinking, well, how can I make them even bigger? So I start thinking about how can I make sculptures that I could take apart? Because, you know, as sculpture is very expensive to ship. So I start figuring out ways that I could make them, you know, to take them apart. So mm -hmm. what I started experimenting was with PVC pipes. And I start using like a heat gun and bending and everything like that. And then after that, I start collecting trash, like Starbucks cups, paper bags, bubble wrap, straws, you know, things that people discard. And then what I would do is I would bulk up certain sections of the PVC pipe and I would, you know, add this stuff on there. And then they became like, they evolve into something else. Um, cause really when I make my work, I don't have a preconceived idea in my head. I just go with the material. I just, I feel the material. I sense the material and everything like that. So I started to be making things that were like five feet tall mm. and I continue to cover them with, uh, coffee. Then I start covering them with sand 
And then my, my most favorite thing was cow manure. And <laughs> some people would so think- where did you get that in downtown Philadelphia? Well, this was when I, cause my, my, my uh, grad school was low residency. So I did come back home to California. Okay. And where I teach is basically in the middle of nowhere by farm fields. And I remember one time um, I got a few kids with me because I had like a, an after school program hiking. So I said, come on, kids, let's go to the hills. And they came with me and I we hiked up this mountain or hill and there was cow patties and they're very beautiful. You know, cows are very good artists, um, even though I know people say it's, you know, not nice things to touch but when you when it's dry it doesn't smell like anything you know it just smells like you know like plant material because they eat grass and hay or whatever so kids would start collecting and they were having you know maybe like a foot pile or two feet pile of <laughs> cow dung and dry cow dung and they would take it we put it in my car and i would uh put it in a blender reconstitute it with water and it became malleable again, but it's not like, you know, like, you know, weird. It was just like plant material. And, but the only thing is you, you got to do it and adhere it right away. I would use a, like a matte medium, put it on the surface, and then I would tack this on. Um, you never want to leave the cow manure in a bucket of water because that's when it starts to stink. But uh, <laughs> I really, I really did enjoy that process and things like that. And something that I, I want to go back again, because I still have a bunch of cow manure in my shed. Um, so then moving forward, as time gone on, you know, my stuff started getting a little taller. I wanted to work more with balance and fragility and with PVC piping. And, you know, you have to have a stable base. It wasn't really working as well. So then I start to learn how to weld and mm -hmm. I start using uh, steel armature as my, and it works a lot better now. It's a lot easier to transport. They don't break is way much easier. So that, and I still use the same process, um, you know, bulk it out, but then I leave some of the metal showing through. And then the other areas I finish it off and I wrap it with materials that I source from myself, my husband, my mom, my dad, when he was still alive. And that's how I start to cover. And I start adding all things. I start adding like, you know, army medallions. I find toys, earrings, necklaces, bottle caps. So, I mean, my, my work is, it takes a lot of time. You know, wrapping is very methodical. It's very relaxing. And then, you know, I look at it and then I start adding my little finishing touches. So, um, but people Gina. have to take some time to really look at my work. Yeah, Gina, what I'm really impressed with is how you see the beauty in everything. So we've gone from, what is it called in Iraq? The, the graveyard. The graveyard. Mm -hmm. And just the way you were describing the graveyard, the way the sun shines on the metal, the rust patterns, and then the mold that grew on the coffee grinds, and then to cow dung. I mean, this was not what I was expecting to talk about today. And I really admire how you see the beauty in really the everyday and how you turn those everyday objects that, you know, most of us would not even take the time to look at and create these graceful sculptures. It's fascinating to me. Well, for me, I, I'm still a child. Even though I'm going to be 53 years old today, I still look at the today? world. Yeah, no, not today. On October 9th, I'll be 53. Okay, all right. All um, right. But I don't know. I just think that it, I see things and I like to still be a child. Um, and I think when we become adults, we're, that's, fr that's frowned upon. You should we gotta be an adult, you know, you're an adult, you know, but I don't know. <laughs> to me, art is a way of being playtime for me. And, and that's what I do. I play, you know, when I'm wrapping things, like I have this one thing I made a while ago where, you know, I look at it, you know, I, I take the gray knit and I wrap it. And then I'm like, oh, I don't know, it's kind of dull. So let me add a little color. 
And then afterwards, I add like this little tiny little thing you can really barely see. It's like a little, it was, it was a little fish. And I don't know, I just think, you know, they're like little characters. Like, I feel like, you know, like a toy story, you know, like these mm -hmm. things are, I mean, they're not, they're not alive, but to me, I feel they have spirits. Like, you know, like this little tiny elephant, someone discarded it. And I like feel bad for him. I'm like, well, he can live on my sculpture and make friends with the rest of the people or the rest <laughs> of the things that I have on my sculpture. So I don't know. I just, I just really, I think, you know, and, and it's helping me preserving more stuff that's going in the environment, you know, especially when kids, when people have babies, I mean, there's a huge influx of stuff they buy. And when they, the kid grows up, where does it go? In the garbage or it goes in a dump or they leave it in a garage. Well, me, to me, that's treasure. You know, I mean, I, there's always the saying, you know, someone else's trash is someone else's treasure. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I do. I like to try to use as much. I mean, I know I'm making a tiny little impact, but I know there's a lot of artists that are like myself that are using found materials. I mean, they use it differently than I do, you know, but I mean, I use it in bulking out underneath their stuff that's hidden. And then on top, I wrap it up with other things. So it's like a double duty that I'm trying to do. And I don't know, I just think the world we are living in, there's a lot of beauty, but unfortunately humans make it ugly. And that's the reason why I try to make art that's lively, colorful, because I want someone to smile. I want someone to think. I want someone to analyze my work and say, well, why, why has she got a bra up there? Why is that? And then she made <laughs> into a, 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 you know, an animal or whatever. Why? You know, I want people to start questioning, you know, their decisions and things like that. And you know, like the garment industry is one of the hugest polluters because, we, you know, I mean, manufacture, manufacture clothes, you know, like, you know, Forever 21 make clothes, you know, $5 top. People get a whole, oh, let's just throw it away. And where does it go? It goes to Goodwill or we put it in shipping containers and we ship it to third world country. And we just do the same thing like we've done in Iraq. We just ship our garbage somewhere else, which we shouldn't be doing that. We should be held accountable. You know, plastic bags is another thing. You know, people still use a lot of plastic bags. And where does it go? It goes in the ocean. All plastic straws, plastic things goes in the ocean. So, but the thing is, people don't realize the damage that we are imposing on Mother Earth. And we are going to suffer because we've got global warming. We've got amount of fires going on. Like right now, you know, there's one in Arizona, New Mexico, you know, California starting all over again and the temperature is rising. And, you know, I just, I wish people would be a little more aware that, you know, no matter what our beliefs are, what our religious beliefs, our political beliefs, we are all integrated. We are yes. all intertwined. What affects someone in a different country eventually is going to affect us. I mean, look at the gas prices, look at, you know, the, the food prices. You know, there's a lot of factors that's going on, but unfortunately, you know, people are not, are not being aware of where they're putting their money into, you know, they, they should be investing in local business, small business, not into huge corporate corporations, because corporations don't care about us little people, you know, like when people buy Nike shoes, I mean, do they realize they're buying shoes that's being, you know, built by child labor and they sell that same shoe for $500. Um, you know, so it's, it's, there's a lot of things that, that are really, I think about in my art, you know, I try to, I mean, I'm not saying I'm perfect, you know, I'm not perfect in any way, but I try to be a little more aware, like where my dollar is going when I'm purchasing things or reusing things. That's the reason why I use my clothes. I'm trying to not, you, you know, give it too much away and just use it in my art. Um, because at least I know it's doing something. And it's also, you know, it's an embodiment of my familial bond. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that it's important to me and family values are not there anymore. You know, I mean, I'm a high school teacher and I witness it every day where kids don't get the support at home. They don't have a mother figure. They don't have a father figure because everybody is on this device and social media. 
People don't talk anymore. People don't communicate anymore. People don't know how to express themselves anymore. And that's why I do what I do. I mean, I want to be expressive. I want to put color. I want to put excitement. And when people look at my work, I mean, I really want them to really hone in and look like, why did she put that button there? Why did she do this? Well, I recognize that that red is not the same color red down here. You know, I really do think very thoroughly when I am, especially when I'm wrapping, you know, like if I use a green, mm -hmm. I try not to use the same green and mm -hmm. things like that. So it's a lot of thoughts that go into my mind and, and sometimes a little anger because I'm really angry with the society as a whole. I mean, the humans are, is probably the worst beings on the planet. Um, I can't say everybody, um, but there is a small percentage of people that I have a lot of respect for people that are environmentalists, people that do good for others, people that help animals. I mean, people that help animals that they are in my heart because that's, that's where my heart is, you know, you know, helping like, you know, Jane, Joan Goodall, you know, Jane Goodall. Yes. Sorry. I yes. mean, I, I, I admire her because she's Absolutely. doing something. You know, Absolutely. people like that, people that are helping the rainforest, people that are helping and the dogs. I mean, I, I really honor those people because they're doing good for the humanity. And well, Gina, you said earlier that you just are doing one small part. And when you consider that you're a teacher and mm -hmm. that you have an opportunity to impact high school students and also college students. so you know, having, you're having a big impact because listening to your talk, you're able to share your values and with people that hopefully, you know, will be more attuned to the environment and have some of the values that you just expressed. Do you feel that the height, when you start to show these, you know, you're an art teacher, when you start to you know, show how you can use these found objects and also at Bakersfield College, what kind of reception do you get from the students? Well, I remember one time I had a girl, um, she told me, she said, you know, when I came to your class, Ms. Herrera, I didn't, I didn't think I could do art. And she said, I remember when we built our shoe because they did a shoe project where they made it out of found material. She said, I actually made out a shoe out of found materials and I never knew I could do that. Aww. And I, and, and really, and the thing is, you know, the school that I teach at is, you know, migrant workers and a lot of these kids don't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So what I want, I, what I'm showing to them is they, they don't, they don't need to go to the store to buy art supplies. I mean, you, they might have to buy a glue gun, but that's all they need is a glue gun, maybe some tape, and then they could just go through their trash and make art, you know, and, I really want them to, to make, be, make them aware that th this is their future. And, and I'm not saying that you and I, it's not our future, but we have lived already um, and things like that. And I, I want them to have hope that they do still have a voice, that they still can stand up, you know, that they need to become aware of what's going on in their world, you know, especially if they decide to have kids. And, but I also tell them there's no shame in not having kids because I chose not to have kids and who would have known, you know, 30 some years later that I would have had, you know, thousands of kids that walked through my classroom. <laughs> and, and still to this day, I mean, I have a kid, I've known him when he was 13 years old. Now he's 31 years old. He's still staying in contact. There's another girl. Aww. She's, I think in her thirties and she sent me some earrings um, because she value and because I was the only one who believed in her and Aww. she became an elementary school teacher. You know? It's just, I mean, those to me means that I have an impact. The other day on Facebook, I, a girl said, even as an adult, I still remember my favorite teacher. And she sent that to me. So Aww. I just, I just think it's, you know, but there are teachers there that do not understand the impact that they can make on these students. Mm -hmm. You know, these kids are needy. And, and I know a lot of times kids, a lot of adults say, oh, those teenagers, this and this. But, you know, teenagers are very, very insightful and they have good instinct and they know when someone is BSing them or not. 
and they know who is honest and not. And, and they know me, I'm very honest with that. I tell them how it is. I tell them, you know, what the world is and they need to start opening their eyes. And I, I give them a lot of tough love. But at the end of the school year, like this past year, I had one girl come crying her eyes out and said, Miss Herrera, I'm going to miss you so much. You've Aww. done so much for me. And a whole other five or six girl came and gave me a hug, thanked me for everything I've done for them. And to me, that is worth more than money. To me, I feel that I have done my purpose. I've done what I have came onto this planet partially is to impact young minds, to make help them make the right decisions. Because really at the end, I want them to be the best version of themselves. I want them when they become older, I always give this analogies. When you're sitting on a park bench one day feeding pigeons, I want <laughs> you to sit there and I want you to be proud of yourself. I want you to say, you know, wow, I really had a really wonderful, engaging life. I've done this. I've done that. And that's what you want to do. When you had the other side of the road, you want to look back at life and say, wow, I did this. I had no one stop me. I tried this. I tried that and be proud of themselves. And that's really what I want. And, and I'm, I'm achieving and I want to be that role model, not just as a teacher, but also as an artist, because I still have a big dream. And my dream is to become a famous artist. That is my dream. That's been ever since I was five years old. And I want my students to witness my journey so that when they become 40 years old, they're like, oh my God, that's Miss Herrera. She's in the Metropolitan Art Museum. She's at the Guggenheim. She's having, she's in the Venice Biennale. She's, oh my God, she did actually. So that if they see me, no matter where I came from or who I am, I still made it. And I want them to believe in themselves that they can make it. It doesn't matter how much money they have. It doesn't matter if their house is tattered or their clothes is tattered is what they have in their heart and their mind and their spirits. And that's what I want to do. Inspire. Gina, you are so <laughs> an inspiring, seems such a shallow word, word. Where do you get this commitment, this focus, this burning desire that, and I have every belief that you will achieve your dreams. Where do you get this motivation? Well, a funny story is when I was younger, my mom kept telling me, why don't you become a school teacher? And I use a few choice words, which I don't want to say on the podcast, <laughs> but I'll put it in a different way. I say, hell no, I don't even want kids. Why would I want to be around kids? So long story short, as we fast forward, when 9-11 happened, I was serving in the Air Force at that time, and I was guarding air, literally. I was sitting in a shack looking at air. And I kind of had this contemplation of life, like, what am I doing with my life? And I start to rethink about what my mom said to me. And then I also thought about like, when I die, what do I want to re be remembered as? Mm -hmm. And I said, how can I make an impact? And so when I start revisiting my mom's uh, suggestion, so I say, you know, maybe I'll become a school teacher. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did it, but I wasn't 100% sure. But when I was doing my student teaching in Chicago, I was teaching, I had to student teach at a school that was pretty kind of on the rough side. And these kids are pretty, you know, they're like, uh -uh, you ain't coming in my world. And I still to this day, and I always wonder about this girl. She was really tough, really tough. You know, you know, I couldn't really have much conversation with her. But I don't know, toward the end, she started talking to me and maybe what I said, you know, my lectures or whatever, she gave me this little angel and said, a stuffed bear, which is an angel. And she said, you were my angel. Oh. So, and then another class, one kid wrote me a song and they bought me a vase and they, you know, really were sad to go. I remember this one kid, he was like six feet tall, big guy. Oh my God, he couldn't. He hated me. I could tell. <laughs> and the last day of school, he said, you know, miss, you know, I didn't like it at first. I said, I know. I said, but you're all right now. 
<laughs> but you know, it's you know, I think they saw who who I really was. And so and I figured, well, if I could connect in such a short time, because I was only there for six weeks, mm. I figured that I had the connection. And then when I came out here to get my interview at the school that I'm currently teaching at, I stood outside and I'm, you know, I'm from Chicago and I'm staying out here in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, what am I doing out here? And then when they interviewed me, they talked about the type of kids, you know, that they were a lot of Hispanic kids, poor kids. And I'm like, well, I, I can relate to them. Mm -hmm. So then I remember the first year was really hard for me because I was homesick. And I'm like, I don't know if I can stay here. And I remember one girl, she told me, Sarah, let me go outside. I need to talk to you. I'm like, okay. And I was like, sounds like a, such an emergency. middle class. I'm like, okay. So we went out. <laughs> and I kind of see she was kind of like trying to buy time for me. And then when I, she said, okay, I'm done. So we walk inside and they presented me with an award saying that I was the best art teacher. Aww. So I knew then and there that that's where I was supposed to be. And I've been there. It's going to be my 18th year. I've been there at Arvin high school. So, and I'm very proud. I'm very proud of my students. You know, I don't care what people say or what people think, but I, my, my kids, I have really great kids. Of course, there's some, you know, they're knuckleheads and some of them, I don't really, we don't get along because of personality, but that's fine. You know, I, but that's a very small percentage, but most of the kids, you know, are, are, are really good kids. They have good hearts. They have good intentions. And Gina, if I could... it's, so in this conversation, you've talked mainly about your kids. I know. <laughs> and I love that because that shows who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. That you're, I mean, you're still focused and very committed to your art, very accomplished art, you know, award winning art. And your, I could just tell from the conversation that your kids are so important to you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so reflective of who you are as a person and how you have achieved everything you've wanted to be and how you are a role, a role model and how really important it is. And I really honor you for that. And thank you. Thank you very much. And Gina, I'm so sorry we're at the end of our time, but I just had to share that observation. And before we leave, can you please share with our listeners one more time where they can see your art and find out more about you? And I know they really want to after listening to you. <laughs> well, you can go on my Instagram, uh, Gina with a G, G-I-N-A dot Herrera, H-E-R-R-E-R-A, the number one, or my website, www.ginaherrera.com. And you can also email me through my website in case you want to connect or ask questions and things like that. So um, I'm very, I am very receptive. You can also message me through Instagram if you are interested. Um, you know, I can always provide workshops and things like that. I really do like to um, engage more of community um, efforts and things like that. Um, Cause I do have big dreams. Um, and I encourage all of our listeners, please go on Gina's website that you could just see the gracefulness and lyricism and just uh, beauty of these sculptures. I really encourage you to do that. Gina, it was such an honor to have you on the podcast and on behalf of everyone. Thank you. And thank you so much for what you're doing and the huge impact that you're having in a number of lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melinda. It was an honor to be on here too. And thank you listeners for being with us on the frequency of creativity, where we are at the intersection of energy and art. <laughs>